Hello everyone and welcome back to AMOS, our course on Agile methods and open source. We discussed in last class session uh, the role of the product owner and its main activities around planning. In this class session we will discuss the software developers and their main role as the people who perform the design and implementation of the software or Agile programming. Next time then it's Agile Coaching for the Scrum Master. We will pick up here uh, various practices, best practices, considered best practices of Agile programming as they came about uh, uh, over time. These practices are not derived from the Scrum Guide uh, because the Scrum Guide again doesn't really say much about software specifically. However, Agile methods are broader than Scrum and various consultants, various, various authors and researchers came up or identified over time various practices that have been uh, identified as being helpful to agility that we want to pick up here. So a large part of the Agile practices, programming practices beyond Scrum actually come from extreme programming and uh, the design patterns community. And so we will explain them here. On the most basic level, there are some uh, principles that you should know. And three are listed here called KISS, Yagni and DRY. KISS, keep it uh, simple. Yagni, you ain't gonna need it and dry, don't repeat yourself. Keeping it simple obviously makes sense. From an agility perspective, the idea is that you should not get too complicated in expectation of future requirements that may never come. And that happens to be the same uh, mostly as Yagni. Uh, don't overdo your designing because whatever you think you're preparing your code base for with that added abstraction, you're actually not going to need it. So keep it simple because whatever you're thinking of might think make things more complicated. You ain't gonna need it. And finally, try, don't repeat yourself. Um, this is an admonishment to keep your code clean and will lead directly uh, to refactoring, removing technical debt, etc., which I will explain a bit later in more detail. Also, the fundamental principle basically of most good programming, but certainly of agile programming, is uh, to avoid premature optimization. And this can be cast in this easy way. As you are developing a feature, a new feature, First, make it run, then make it right, and only then make it fast. So you implement something to get it going, to gather feedback. That's, how you may, that's why you make it run. And it may not be clean, it may not be elegant, but the point is you see it run and you can gather feedback on whether that's actually what's needed, what's wanted. No? Otherwise, you would be programming the wrong thing. So once you have it up and running, you can then, as you understand what it really does and that this is what, you're, what is needed, then you can make it right. Then you change the code to have a nice, clean design, uh, ideally simple design. So now you made it right after you first made it run. And only after you have a simple, clean design without any craft or technical debt from making it run, now you make it fast. You can optimize it, which may add complexity and special cases for optimization purposes. But the key is you only make it fast after you made it right. In general, the good design is also the efficient design. So hopefully there's not a lot of need for overly complicated uh, optimizations. One interesting aspect of Agile programming is collective code ownership compared or contrasted to individual code ownership, which you might find outside of, uh, outside of Agile programming, for example, in open source or in traditional software development. 
So collective code ownership is the idea that everyone is responsible for the whole code base. If there's a bug, it's your responsibility, whether you created that bug or not. Frame positively, everyone's allowed to fix the bug. You don't have to call on someone else. You can go ahead and fix the bug because it also falls on your feet if it's not working. So the purpose is here to instill an overall feel of responsibility, which ensures or leads to high quality because um, you want everyone else to also develop high quality code so that you don't have to fix their bugs all the time. Collective code ownership is a hallmark, hallmark of agile methods where at least in theory, everyone can work on every piece of the overall code base. Individual code ownership compared to this is different. You are an individual, you're responsible for the code that you wrote, but not for other people's uh, code. And so that leads to a componentization of the software. You divvy up the work, you assign components to people who are then responsible for it, but only for their components, not for the other components and also not really for the overall system. With individual code ownership, the question arises who is responsible for the integration as independently developed components might not work with each other. So you immediately have a hierarchy of people, which is somewhat antithetical to agile programming, where supposedly everyone in a team has equal rights. Individual code ownership you naturally get uh, with open source in a distributed setting when you're not co-located, etc. But agile programming is clearly wants you to have collective code ownership. Another best practice is uh, an agile practice, well, like not specifically agile, but is to have a programming standard, to have shared coding guidelines that make the code that different people write look the same. So it's a set of rules and conventions of how to name things, how to format and structure your code. And following such a standard, if everyone follows such a standard, it makes it easier to uh, read the code that other people have written. It's particularly important if you have uh, uh, collective code ownership because you might be running and might have to fix other people's code. So you want it to be easy to understand it. Programming standards are key. Um, code is written many is read many more times than it is written nine times it's read for one time that it's written so really make sure that you follow a shared programming uh, standard and not just and, and define and say what your programming standard is programming standards only go so far i want to point to my course on advanced design and programming where we discuss the professional language of software developers as it goes beyond the basics of programming standards for example, I'm picking on uh, language around methods of classes now, or functions and classes now, where you would talk about different types of query methods, mutation methods, helper methods. Everyone knows getters and setters, get methods and set methods. But you also have, as a professional developer, a vocabulary where it's very clear or should be very clear what a factory method is, an assertion method is, an initialization method is so that the communication between you and your peers is fluid, uh, flows well, has clear meaning without a lot of chance of misunderstanding and repetition. You're just much more effective as you learn and grow into your professional language. Collective code ownership is an interesting um, approach which has multiple consequences um, for one and it goes together with the idea that as you implement features as people pick up features to implement they have to drive and they are responsible for the full implementation of these features so what the latter means is that 
if you pick a feature which says yeah you want to be able to log in or you want to be able uh, to tell a friend that's a feature and such and the implementation of a feature touches on the whole code base so you may have to go for, through you may have to go from the user interface through a domain model all the way into the persistence layer to implement some functionality uh, what i just uh, what i just uh, said are the different uh, not layers it's the tiers of an architecture or the code layers of, uh, of a static architecture and as a developer you now need to know how to program the user interface you need to understand the domain model and you know how to deal with the database that is a consequence of being business value driven because the business value is in that feature getting done and not in the implementation of a particular aspect to it. So in Agile methods, you um, have this um, uh, responsibility for the whole feature because you're coming from business value, which means that you need to know the whole architecture as features cross all tiers and layers of the static and dynamic code architecture. Now that makes it really hard as systems get larger. So a common uh, way of dealing with the complexity that arises from uh, complex user interface frameworks, complex domain models is actually to have featured teams. So form teams of people who uh, implement a feature where then within that team, different people may specialize on either the UI uh, um, uh, tier and layer or the domain model or the persistence and so you collaborate within a team to get a feature done which means you need to have an ability to communicate quickly and uh, instantaneously arguably so ideally you're sitting next to each other in an office um, and this way you can deal with the complexity of larger uh, larger software systems so that's called a feature team in parallel, the feature teams open the opportunity to ensure that the architecture does not degrade. See, the problem of a problem with um, being responsible for a whole feature across all layers is that your mind is on implementing that feature, not necessarily ensuring architectural integrity. And as such, as you implement your feature, you might break something in a layer because you don't know better. You, know, you have to be very broad to go across all the um, layers or tiers in the architecture. And feature teams help avoid that because as you specialize on one particular uh, code layer, like uh, the domain framework or the uh, user interface layer, code layer, um, as you do that, you know how to better handle it and also you know your peers in the other feature teams and can coordinate so as a consequence as you implement your feature you can also work across the feature teams and ensure that the way how you implement your feature conforms to the architecture of that particular code layer and doesn't disintegrate it or hurt it long term so you exchange and work on the one hand within your feature team but on the other hand with the other people in the other feature teams who work on the same code layer as you do and this way you can ensure that the architecture doesn't degrade still it's not entirely possible impossible it's not entirely it's not it's not possible to keep everything uh, always well done after all you first make it run and then make it right so uh, always at some point of time there's something that runs but isn't necessarily right or clean and uh, intuitively to a developer which is uh, what is shoddy code um, this has been named uh, or has been called technical debt using a financial metaphor for the purposes of appealing to managers. 
So I believe that Ward Cunningham, who you can see here, invented this term. And so let's listen to him explain the notion of technical debt to us. I became interested in the way metaphors uh, influence how we think uh, after reading George Lakoff and Mark Johnson's uh, Metaphors We Live By. An important idea is that we reason uh, by analogy with the uh, uh, me metaphors that have entered our language. I coined the the debt metaphor to explain the refactoring that we were doing uh, on the uh, Ycash product. This was a, a, an early uh, a product done in uh, Digitalk Smalltalk, and it was important to me that we uh, accumulate the, the learnings we did about the application over time by modifying the program to to look as if it had been uh, as if we had known what we were doing all along and it, and to look as if it had been easy to do in small talk the explanation uh, i gave to my boss and this was financial software was a uh, financial analogy i called the debt metaphor and that said that if we failed to make our program align with what we then understood to be the proper way to think about uh, our financial objects, then then we were going to continually stumble over that disagreement and uh, that would slow us down, which is like paying interest on a loan uh, with with borrowed money, you can do something sooner than you might otherwise, but then until you pay back that money you'll uh, you'll be paying interest. I uh, I thought borrowing money was a good idea. I thought that rushing software out the door to get some experience with it was a good idea. But that of course you uh, you would eventually go back and as you learn things about that software you would uh, repay that loan by, uh, by refactoring the program to to reflect your your experience as you acquired it. I think that there were plenty of cases where people would rush software out the door and uh, learn things, but never, never put that learning back into the program. And and I and that, that by analogy was uh, uh, borrowing money, thinking that you never had to pay it back. Of course, if you do that, you know, say with your credit card, eventually all your income goes to interest and your purchasing power goes to zero. By the same token, if you develop a program for a long period of time by only adding features and never reorganizing it to reflect your understanding of those features, then eventually that program simply does not contain any understanding and all efforts to work on it to take longer and longer. Uh, in other words, the interest is total. Uh, you'll make zero progress. A lot of uh, bloggers, at least, have uh, explained the debt metaphor and uh, confused it, I think, with uh, the idea that you could write code poorly with the intention of doing a good job later and, and, and thinking that that was the primary source of debt. I'm, I'm never in a favor of writing code poorly, but I am in favor of writing code uh, to reflect your current understanding of a problem, even if that understanding is partial. You know, if you want to be able to go into debt that way by uh, developing software that you don't completely understand, uh, you're wise to make that software reflect your understanding as best you can. So that when it does come time to refactor, it's clear what you were thinking when you wrote it and making it easier to refactor it into what your current thinking is now. In other words, the, the whole debt metaphor or let's say the ability to pay back debt and make the debt metaphor work for your advantage depends upon you writing code that is clean enough to be able to refactor as you come to understand your problem. I think that's a, a good methodology. It's at the heart of extreme programming. Uh, the debt metaphor is an explanation, one of many explanations of why extreme programming works. All right, so this was uh, Ward Cunningham 
on technical debt. He mentioned extreme programming, one of the early agile methods. And um, he also talked about refactoring, which is how you remove technical debt. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. So for now, technical debt is, as a definition, the lack of quality or comprehensiveness of code. And it has a purpose, which is you accept technical debt. You don't create it on purpose, but you accept it as you build software quickly to learn about requirements and how it works. So make it run. But you should return and uh, make it right by changing the poorly written code, not deliberately, but speedily written code to uh, be better code, which will not induce future bugs or delays. So basically, by doing speedy upfront development, making it run, you're incurring a debt and you're paying it back by making the code uh, right. He didn't talk that much, but he did mention it. What Cunningham did mention, how this metaphor works well in the communication with managers who otherwise might argue, why do you ask? Why do you need that time to clean up the code? Do it properly in the first place. And beyond that, we don't have time for it because we need to develop we need to create value for the business and cleaning up code in many managers eyes or brains is not creating value because no customer is paying for cleaner code if the code does the job why bother cleaning it up and the technical debt metaphor gives you an answer why cleaning it up is a good idea so cleaning it up or managing technical debt means first understanding it so identifying any technical debt then figuring out whether you need to do something about it and then if you think you need to do something about it how to do it so the identification of technical debt goes by so-called code smells code smells badly that indicates technical debt um, as some code smells, it may not be so bad yet. So you need to cross a threshold of smelliness um, before you should act. But as you decide now you have to act or you want to act, you refactor your code. And as you do that, you can follow so-called refactorings or certain patterns of restructuring your code to remove the smell. So. A code smell is an identifiable structure in your code that violates established principles of good design and clearly reduce the overall code quality. They're not bugs. The, the, the code works. It just doesn't look right. It just irks the uh, seasoned software developer. <clears throat> Example code smells if you have copy and pasted code. Now yeah, that's the obvious one, duplicate code. You copied and pasted the same three thing three times. Maybe it should have been a loop with three iterations. Or you have a very long method. Obviously, maybe it should have been broken up into pieces that do smaller things, make the code much better readable and understandable, and so forth. The book that you saw passing by in the footer of an earlier page uh, is called the Refactoring Book. will list you the most common uh, common smells. Now that you can identify um, shoddy code or uh, technical debt by way of its smells, you need to figure out whether you need to do something about it. And here the three strikes rule is commonly quoted as a good indicator of do you need to act, which is uh, the first time it doesn't matter, the second time you observe it and are not happy, but it doesn't cross your threshold of a need to act yet. So you copy and paste something and it's there a second time. All right, you can still live with it. As you copy and paste for the third time, maybe it's time to introduce a loop or pull out that code into a method, etc. So that's when you fix the code by changing the code structure, but not the behavior which is what you call refactoring. The refactoring is the behavior preserving transformation of code. It gets better afterwards. It's usually slimmer, simpler, easier to understand, 
but the actual behavior did not change. You're not introducing new features, you're not fixing bugs. And so this process of identifying, deciding, and then acting or fixing on technical debt by refactoring uh, leads to a development process or a view on the development process where you're basically going back and forth between two modes or two hats sometimes called that you're wearing. Most of the time or some of the time you are in your mode of adding new functionality. You're creating business value by adding uh, a feature that the customer wants. As you do so and maybe you only make it run and not yet right, the code starts to smell. If it only smells bad enough, you switch to the other mode, the refactoring mode. In the refactoring mode, you're not adding new features, you're not creating more business value for the customer, you're just removing the technical the, the smell and thereby the technical debt. You're making the code more livable for the software developers with the purpose of being able to maintain development speed over time and not get bogged down by increasingly unmanageable poorly written code because you need never refactored you never removed the smells you're paying interest on the technical debt that you accumulated over time to such an extent as the metaphor goes that all your efforts go to paying off the technical debt but not making any business progress There's a lot of advice and help on how to refactor your code. So if there's three times copy and pasted code, then maybe you should extract that into a separate method so that the three instances of the copy and pasted code become individual methods call, method calls. And then there's one method that does the uh, programming of these three copy and pasted code segments parameterized by what varied between the three code segments. You pull up a field in a class hierarchy, you extract a template method to structure a process, you decompose a conditional. All of these are described and documented behavior preserving changes, uh, that is refactorings to your code, and you can look them up in the book and on the web. <clears throat> so you align these things. Duplicated code can be fixed if need be by extract method or pull up field or something else. A long method or an overly long method can be fixed by another time using extract method again or decompose conditional, etc. etc. So, depending on the situation, there are different ways of removing the smell, but all of these ways are documented refactorings. Refactorings are very common now and they've entered our main vocabulary so much so that you can find the concept of refactoring in an IDE uh, where it's effectively, literally, <laughs> uh, a, a function in a menu you call. And you can see it here. I clicked on some token and I right clicked on it and chose the refactor menu and there's a gazillion of potential refactorings possible here. The most obvious one is rename, fixing a poor name to be a better name. And what the tool does is to find all the occurrences of this name and change them all at once. If you don't use the refactoring functionality, you have to change all occurrences of some variable or class or method by yourself and um, since it usually leads to compile time errors, uh, compilation errors, if you forget some, uh, that might keep you busy. It's very much a machine processable solution. Not all refactorings can be done fully automatically, but some can. And rename is usually the one that can be fully automated. It also happens to be the one refactoring that everyone uses through the user interface because there's really no point in doing it by hand. So beyond refactoring our smelly code to become better and clean code that has carries less or no debt around, 
we can also improve the quality of our code base. In agile programming, quality assurance rests with the developers. There's no separate quality assurance department like in traditional development. So whatever traditionally a quality assurance engineer does in agile, unless you organize for it differently, in agile programming has to be done by the software developers themselves. Certainly in Amos, we only have software developers, no separate test engineers or quality assurance engineers. So you need to write your own test code. Test code or testing is a process of assessing correct operation according to a specification. So you verify against the specification. And uh, the tests are an expression of that verification. So you need that uh, specification which often is only in your mind, uh, but ideally it ties back to the feature, even if that has been described on a high level using business value user stories only. Different types of tests. I hope you've had a lecture or a course on quality assurance, which also explained how to test, but let me keep it quick or sh short here. There are component tests, which test particular units acceptance tests which uh, which test cross-cutting functions that go across several components like things you might start on a user interface and integration tests which test the system as a whole as the different possibly independently developed component so that wouldn't be very agile the possibly independently developed components are put together for the system tests can be automated uh, you run test code and then it automatically runs and tells you what's wrong with the system or not based on what has been programmed. Tests can also be performed manually by a human sitting in front of a user interface and clicking around. Both are valid and valuable forms of tests. Ideally, they are performed in a structured and repeatable way, including how a human tests the software following certain scripts, written scripts, etc. Now, in Agile programming, we do, or we used to do until we improved it, uh, test-first programming. The idea of test-first programming is that you think through the feature, so you have a feature to implement, and you think through what this means, and what it means in terms of a specification, you encode in a set of tests before you even try to implement the feature. It's very counterintuitive for many people. You first write the test, and then you try to satisfy the test by implementing the functionality that the feature asks you to do. Most people will first implement the functionality and then they write test code for it. Test first programming says you should be programming the tests first so you look at the feature and its potential implementation from multiple perspectives and write test methods, test functions for that before you even implement it. It's a way of clarifying and cleaning up your understanding of what needs doing by thinking it through from the testing perspective and not just from the user perspective. This gives you two perspectives, the test perspective and the user perspective and your implementation will be cleaner because these two perspectives are triangulating and get you closer to what you're supposed to do than if you just jumped in head first, going from feature to implementation and so forth. So you can see it here as a sequence of steps. You start with the feature, you do the first tests, you do the implementation, you return to the tests, you do another implementation round, etc. So you write the tests and move to implementation. You don't write all the tests for the complete implementation. You also incrementally do that. So you do a simple test first and a simple implementation. Then you do more tests to cover more corner cases of the implementation. So you incrementally build out in an interplay the tests for the implementation and then the implementation. So this leads to a work rhythm where you write a test which then fails and because it fails you have fixing to do by implementing the functionality that makes the test pass. The assumption is the test is correct 
and uh, it's not a bug in the test but rather it's simply the missing functionality or as a work rhythm it's red green refactor which goes back to the testing frameworks uh, of a old uh, JUnit most notably where you would get a red light if the tests fail a green light when the tests work but now you only made it run you didn't yet make it right so maybe you refactor it next and then you continue for the next test first then implementation cycle so test first programming makes a lot of sense to some is counterintuitive to others it's been extended to a whole development process now so from test first programming we are uh, moving on now to test driven development where basically we repeat the test first programming for the whole incoming stream of features through the product backlog or whatever your to-do list uh, looks like so at the core what you're currently doing is test first programming of the feature you want to do but in test driven development once you finish that one feature meaning you can't think of more tests to write uh, which implies the feature implementation is complete assuming the tests succeed then you move on to the next feature uh, from the queue you pick the top feature and then you start uh, test first programming it right away again this way you basically have a stream of incoming feature requests to do you do each feature one by one using test first programming and the whole thing is called test driven development um, the accumulation of test suites of course need to be consistent so if you write new code that breaks old tests you're equally responsible for fixing the old implementations or the old tests to work uh, in line with the features that they find them so um, as you test first program one feature anything you break it's your responsibility to fix it so at any point of time the whole system passes the test suites and you can move on to the next feature maintaining steady speed assuming you have good test coverage and as a consequence low technical debt another aspect of agile programming is uh, code review uh, how and when to review code so code review is the practice of having somebody else assess your code uh, to give you feedback and also possibly to approve it before it makes it into the code repository as officially accepted code for the project more formally it's a systematic examination of computer source code for certain quality criteria there are different ways of how you can go about code review uh, there is pair programming walkthroughs inspections and what we do in uh, on github uh, peer review they're different and how you do it depends really on when it is done you can do the code review as you write the code that would be pair programming because the feedback you get needs to be provided as you write the code so it's got to be from that person sitting next to you um, the code review can also come or happen before you commit the code that's pre-commit code review or peer review uh, before well, of pull requests or merge requests and it can also happen after commits at a much later time as, as it's sometimes done and before release uh, you know, for example where everything is reviewed the best time really for code review is as soon as possible meaning uh, if it doesn't have an exterior purpose like a customer employing some third party to review your code to make sure it's up to the quality they were expecting if that exterior motives aren't there you really want the feedback right away because the longer you wait 
for the feedback and the longer uh, you get removed from the code you wrote, the more expensive it gets to fix whatever the code review may ask you to fix. So of the two examples I just listed, uh, pair programming is the first one, is the practice of two people sitting in front of the same display. So in the old days, you would really sit next to each other, but you would have different roles. One, so both of you are software developer, but within that uh, setting, you are either uh, the driver, that's the person who is typing and programming, or the co-driver, sometimes also the pilot, the person again acting, writing code, and the navigator trying to keep the big picture, where are we headed, etc., providing the feedback. So the active person is writing code, which almost out of necessity makes their view of what they're doing, the view of the world, narrow. When you get tunnel vision, you focus on getting the syntax right, well, maybe a bit higher level because it's in your fingers already, but still you, you are thinking about the minute details of the code you're writing so that there aren't small bugs in your code. The navigator, the second person, is at a higher plane, watching what you're doing, thinking about are we headed the right direction? Do we really need that method or are we missing an opportunity to refactor extract a method here and they will provide that feedback which is on a higher level of getting a semicolons or line breaks uh, right. You can see some illustrations here, they are a bit older uh, photos um, but of course you can also do pair programming online from your, uh, from your homes so you need to find that partner um, the recommendation is that you are not driving all the time, but that you rather switch these roles, that you don't fall silent, but communicate it, communi keep communicating, etc. There's no implication that you always have to pair program. In fact, in Amos, we don't ask you to pair program anyway. That's up to you. And certainly small stuff, you don't, don't have to do it necessarily. Often people choose the same partners because they are compatible somehow. You don't always have to do that. Um, you can. Um, and sometimes it's actually good to switch uh, partners. More common in today's distributed, even distributed agile software development world is the pre-commit code review. And it's become so common because it's so easy to do it using um, GitHub and GitLab and similar tools where you submit, even if you have the change, even if you have write rights to the code repository, where you send a pull request so that somebody else reviews your code and approves of it. It's not that you couldn't approve it yourself. The point is that somebody else looks it through to catch the bugs that are not obvious to you, but that are obvious to a second pair of eyes. So pre-commit code review is when some peer looks at your code, provides feedback and possibly approves it, approves your pull request and lets it into the code base. For one, pre-commit code review strengthens the feeling of collective responsibility. It's not just your code, somebody else approved of it. They are equally arguably responsible for it. Um, as you look at other people's code across the whole code base, it improves the knowledge sharing and the teamwork going on. You, you more broadly are aware of what's going on, what your other folks are doing, things that go wrong, etc. Best practices of writing code spread, diffuse more quickly. Also, maybe that's the that should be at the top. You you catch the bugs earlier on. Yeah, you you catch the pro problems before they uh, get real and fester. Essentially, you are all getting more disciplined, and you raise the quality of software development and get better software developers. As you approve um, such pull or merge requests, uh, you might want to add traceability. You might want to link the code that is being submitted to the issues it fulfills. 
So in general terms, it's called traceability, the ability to trace something back to its roots so you know where it's coming from. And for source code, the traceability is the ability to trace back every piece of code to the requirements it fulfills. For every piece of code, you know why it's there by way of that trace link back to the requirement, which on GitHub would be would mean linking pull requests to the issue they are supposed to fulfill. So as you manage your um, issues through the feature board and as you work on implementing uh, these issues, these feature requests, you can link the pull requests that fulfill the code you write and that you submit by way of pull request. You can link that code to the issue and thereby you're able to clearly show why some code was submitted. This uh, traceability uh, is helpful to understanding your code and in many cases it's even required. There's a lot of software that has to fulfill certification requirements and it's a common certification to ensure that there is no superfluous code in your code base and you show that by linking every single commit back to its requirements. If there's no such trace link or backlink, then the code is there for no known reason and really shouldn't be there. So you can claim at least a minimal, a minimal code base with no, no superfluous code if you maintain those trace links. There's also another disciplining moment to it. Your commits in order to be useful for such backlinking or traceability need to be focused. They need to focus or work on that particular issue and not on four or three issues in parallel. That's good style anyway. Yeah, you should be working as you write code. You write the code to fulfill one issue, not many. Uh, you should be doing that anyway. But if you do, you can make your code uh, traceable and that's beneficial and in some instances even required of your code. All right, and then software programmed in an agile manner or not, of course, needs to be turned from source code into running binaries or similar things. So you need to build your software. The build process is the process of creating installable software from its source artifacts. Can be short, can be very elaborate, depending on the situation. What you really want it to be is fully automated. You, know, you, you really do not want to need a human to push forward and the build process. You want to start at once and then you want to be able for it to run through fully automatically. If it gets interrupted because something's broken, ideally you also want to restart it. If it's build processes in particular of large systems can be complex and lengthy in terms of duration. So you want to be able to restart. You don't have to start from the beginning again. You get interrupted, some exception or error happens, the build, build stops. You want to be able to restart it after you fix the uh, fix the issue. And most importantly, you want the build process to take place in a defined environment. What you don't want is that every single developer runs a build process on their own machine with a different outcome. The outcomes always need to be the same. So you need to make sure that this build is both deterministic and has a defined context independent build environment. All the variables have been set, all the tools are there in exactly one particular configured way. If you build on your local machines without a proper build process, but you build by hand, you will never get that. So you need to use a build tool where, which creates a closure or some, some enclosure uh, the independent environment of your own workstation that sets all the variables, that creates the proper setup, etc. Um, so that you can um, uh, 
create and recreate the same build from the same source code. And of course you can use say GitHub Actions for that if you are going through GitHub or you use uh, a build tool like Gradle or Maven or what have you. It's your responsibility as a developer not to break the build um, in a way that it affects others. You can certainly break the build if you're testing something locally, but you should not be committing code to the official uh, main line of your code repository. So never try to never force in code into the main line that doesn't even compile or that doesn't pass all the tests. Do all of that testing locally before you submit a pull request on GitHub or a merge request on GitLab and um, do that and then commit only and ask for the review if you did your part and you are not breaking the build. And uh, that requires that even on your workstation as you run tests, uh, you need to have that standardized work environment. It used to be these comics uh, cartoons are getting old, fortunately, that people would simply save their work to the code repository on Friday afternoon to get it off their local machine, whether the code compiled or not. And that, of course, was uh, just, uh, just wrong. If you have a defined build environment that runs through fully automatically, you can, um, you can up your game. You can improve what you're doing to get faster and more agile. You can add continuous integration to the automated build. Continuous integration is the practice of automatically building and testing the software upon defined triggers. So having an automated build is just that. It doesn't mean the build runs. But if you trigger a build on, for example, a commit to a code repository, then you have automated not just the building itself, but also that you get the feedback about whether the build is still good as fast as possible. Ideally, really, every commit of a developer to the main line triggers a build so that you get a signal on whether the build is still in a good shape, meaning compiles, runs, all the tests are green. As builds get more complex and more expensive, maybe you can't run it on every commit, but maybe you do it once a night, so-called nightly builds. Really, as long as it's just computing power, I think we're headed to, towards builds to really just on every single commit. You may stage of the, uh, the extent of this so-called continuous integration where the builds are triggered upon commits, most notably, um, into different scopes. Yeah? So um, you don't have to, you can have a software architecture where, which is so compartmentalized that the build, that a commit is analyzed and only what really changes is built anew and the rest is left in place, assuming it wouldn't have changed anyway. And the purpose of all of this is continuous integration is to always have the latest version of the software in executable form and then also to run it, uh, not necessarily in production, but to run the tests. Because as soon, the sooner you know, the faster you know that something is wrong, the, more, the faster you can react to it, the faster you can react to an issue becoming apparent, the faster you are to fix it. So overall costs keep low and speed keeps uh, being high. And beyond automated builds, continuous integration, you can go even one step further, though this is at present still the high art, not necessarily expected of student projects, but try. Uh, it's called continuous deployment. So not only are you building are you fully automating your build? And not only are you automatically testing by way of continuous integration your builds, you're also putting it into production, meaning 
you are actually operating the software for your users. It's not so easy to do that in the Amos pro well, you can do it, but uh, it's doubtful that your uh, industry partner is there every day playing with the software, but you can still deploy the software all the time and use it yourself in production. So that is uh, the, the high art, so to speak, today. And as you do that, uh, you have to monitor the software because the purpose of continuous deployment, of course, is uh, to fully automatically go from some work a developer does to the work the developer does creates its business value for the owners of the software because the code the programmer wrote is already in production, is doing its job, providing that new feature to users and hence they get the benefit of the investment, the salary of the developer. So um, as you do that, things could go wrong, of course, as you fully automate that and no human eyes um, uh, look at it, things could go wrong. Uh, just because the machine thinks everything's all right doesn't mean everything really is all right. Not only are there bugs in general, but that last commit that triggered the build, the continuous integration, and the continuous deployment, that last um, uh, commit might have introduced subtle bugs that weren't covered by the tests and become only apparent to the user. Uh, my favorite example is just a white buy button by way of a typo on a white background. Your web shop or whatever you're selling on the web will suddenly make no money at all if users can't find the buy button because it's white on white, white text on white background. To the computer, the color, the colors doesn't matter. The computer doesn't look at it like that. So there are always subtle bugs that a computer will not catch, but that developers or human eyes can. And so you need additional monitoring metrics like are we selling more or are we selling less? to decide on whether something's wrong, possibly pull back the, uh, pull back the uh, deployment or have a human intervene and fix it quickly. So this leads to at least three stages of building and testing and deploying your software called the developer environment, the test environment and the production environment. And you can see the steps that you're usually going through here. Uh, in the develop environment, you have your edit, compile, build uh, and run cycles. You deploy locally for running and you run your tests. And if you're satisfied, you commit. By way of continuous integration, the software is built again from whatever else may have happened in between. And so the um, test environment uh, builds the software uh, deploys it and runs the tests now beyond the single workstation. And if you're having continuous deployment going on and the test just succeeded, you release the software as an intermediate um, release to uh, the production environment where you deploy, operate and monitor the software. That's the high art of going all the way from a single from the work that a developer does and commits to running the software, usually in the cloud these days, and uh, monitoring it. These build processes are important. Uh, I already asked you to uh, demonstrate your build process, and that should make it easy for you now to deliver this, uh, uh, to provide this deliverable. Please make a recording, maybe using OBS, it's easy. Um, to show us your build process by way of little video. More is in the homeworks document. Now we are headed for the mid project uh, release. And for that, we would like to do the mid project review. It's coming up. Please be ready next time to uh, demo your software. Um, I would like to see how one command starts the software. Um, I may or may not ask for an initial build, but um, I um, ask you to at least demo the software. And uh, you should perhaps have, not perhaps, you should have a simple script 
for the most common use case that you've been working on so you can demo it. This is actually helpful for the final demo. I don't want to see test data one, test data two. I want to see a small, simple story of why a user uses your software and how they use it. So try to make that plastic and vivid and illustrating, uh, whatever you call them, if it's John or Jane and they have a need, go with that rather than user one and test data one. And so we will call on you to demonstrate that. And as always, uh, this is to help you move forward. Feel free to ask the other teams and coordinate with them how they are doing. So that's it for me for today on Agile programming. We covered all the basic Agile practices, mostly derived from extreme programming and then some. Thank you for your time and attention and see you in the next class.